Now, there is so much that could be said about the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, I think the Lord has led me today to preach not just on a single theme, but, but broadly on the subject of Christ's resurrection. And to show something of the breadth of the significance of Jesus' resurrection. The first thing that we need to say is that what we celebrate today is a literal, physical, historical event that the Bible presents us with. Jesus left an empty tomb behind him. He rose physically, bodily, to life again. He showed his solidness to those who thought he was a ghost. Some of those disciples, just like you and I, if, if we met someone who'd come back from the dead, they, they'd be a bit terrified and a bit confused. Well, those first disciples, we find out in various places, were, were confused. Even when Jesus is standing there in front of them, they can't quite believe their eyes for joy. And, uh, and jo Jesus, in, in Luke 24, um, I won't read it. I come along this evening. I think it's part of the readings this evening. So um, Jesus this evening, uh, Jesus this evening, Jesus um, in that passage there presents himself and he invites his disciples to come and touch him. He shows them his hands and his feet, he shows them the wounds that the crucifixion, that the nails of the crucifixion had made. And he says, he says, look and touch. And even when they still can't quite believe it, he, he says, well, have you got anything to eat? And they go and scrabble around the kitchen and find some fish and, and Jesus eats it in their presence. So this is a literal, physical, historical event we're talking about. Not some sort of woolly, spiritual thing in the sense of just sort of vague, but it's physical. We're talking about solid bodies here. A solid body, one solid body coming to life again. Now the second thing that we need to be clear uh, from what the Bible teaches, that I need to make clear to you uh, and proclaim from what the Bible teaches, is that Jesus, when he rose from the dead, physically, solidly, he rose never to die again. Now this is a new, a new thing. Jesus in Revelation 1 verse 18 says, I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. Romans chapter 6 verse 9, uh, Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. So what we're celebrating today is a unique event never heard of before or since. Someone coming back to life again forevermore. There have been resurrections. The Bible tells us that. There have been a number. I was surprised when I came to list them, actually. There's a lot. There are three that Jesus did. There was Lazarus in John chapter 11. There's the, um, Jairus' daughter. Um, there's the, the son of the widow from Nain. Those are the three that are reported in the Gospels. There are other resurrections as well. There's Tabitha in Acts chapter 9 who came to life. Um, and, and there's um, those who came to life at the moment Jesus died. Matthew chapter 27, verse 52. There's even in the Old Testament, there's um, the Shunammite son in 2 Kings chapter 4. All of these people bodily came back to life again. But Jesus is different because Jesus physically rose again, never to die again. All those unfortunate people had to die again, had to die twice. But Jesus was raised never to die again. So the, the wonderful and amazing thing about Jesus' res resurrection is that this is the resurrection of God's only son, never to die again. So what we're talking about this morning, what we're thinking about is a one-of-a-kind, in a category of its own, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And it's of such uniqueness and weight and significance that it changes everything. It affects every single person full stop, whether they believe in him or not. It affects all of us, every single one of us. Now, the first thing that we should probably see, having put those things in place, is that it changes everything for Jesus himself, according to his human nature, that is. He's, he's fully God and fully man, 100% God and 100% man. And in his human nature, it changes everything for him. It was the moment of his vindication. It's, it's the moment when his state of humiliation ends and gloriously is transformed into his state of exaltation that lasts forever. Jesus is now manifest victor. Those who did their worst to him, as we thought earlier, what they have done has been overturned by Jesus. And more than that, in his state of humiliation, like we thought on Good Friday, in Jesus' uh, state of agony and, and, and suffering, he bore our sin. He drank the bitter cup 
that our sin deserves. But his resurrection decisively shows the end of that condemnation. Jesus stands condemned for our sin no more. He is fully paid for those who trust in him. There's wonderful comfort there. We'll come back to that. Let me then trace what Christ's resurrection means for each of us. It it changes everything for each of us. So firstly, we'll look at what it means for the unbeliever. And then secondly, we'll look at three things it means for believers. So firstly then, what Jesus' resurrection means for every non-believer. We're going to look here at Acts chapter 17. You might like to turn there. It's on page 927. Just a couple of verses from Acts 17. Page 927. It's verses 30 and 31. This is Paul here uh, speaking in Athens to a, 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 a group of uh, pagan philosophers. And he says this. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. God then has established a day when he's going to judge the world. And he's given assurance of that by raising the one who who he's going to do it through, from the dead. So the resurrection of Jesus is incredibly serious news for anyone that rejects Jesus. Because it spells his victory over all rejection of him, like we thought earlier. He has defeated and, and... assured the destruction of all who remain in defiance of him. He's Lord and judge of the world. His resurrection assures us of this. Mankind's been in rebellion from the start against God since since the Garden of Eden. And that culminated in that rejection at the cross of Christ where God incarnate is rejected even to the point of crucifixion. C.S. Lewis, uh, um, there's a helpful quotation, uh, it goes something like this. Uh, Given half the chance, uh, fallen humanity will murder their creator. That's what we did. Given half the chance, we murdered our creator. We murdered God in the flesh. But Christ's resurrection overturns this. Sinful humanity does not have the last word then. God does. And his last word is is his son, resurrected, glorified, and enthroned as judge. And so Jesus' resurrection, we find in Romans chapter 1, verse 4, is God's declaration of him in power that he is the Son of God. Just as God speaks at Jesus' baptism, literally speaks from heaven, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, God metaphorically speaks even more loudly at the resurrection of Jesus, that he is God's Son, with whom God is well pleased. Jesus' resurrection is that moment in Psalm 2, if you know Psalm 2, when in response to all the world's conspiring against God and his anointed, God and his Messiah, God and his Christ, then God, in, in, in the face of all of that, laughs and says, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I think that in that reading in Matthew, the guards at the tomb had the right idea when they trembled and became like dead men, it says. Jesus' resurrection means the certain destiny of those who continue in their rejection of God and his word and his son is for the Lord Jesus Christ to dash them in pieces like pottery. Psalm 2, verse 9. Now that is terrifying, and yet in these passages that tell us this, it also tells us that there is a window of opportunity opened for us to repent and be saved. So in Acts 17, it says, God commands all people everywhere to repent, to turn from their sin, and humble themselves before God. And in in, um, Psalm 2, it says this, be wise, be warned, kiss the Son, the Son of God, kiss him in in an act of allegiance to him as, as your king. Kiss the Son lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So God has opened this opportunity to be saved. 
You see, God could easily have, on Easter Sunday, nearly 2,000 years ago, when he resurrects Jesus from the tomb, he could have immediately summoned the world to stand before Christ to be judged. But he's not. He's left this time. He's leaving, he's leaving an opportunity for people like you and me to turn in repentance and humble confession of our sin and come and be saved. So is there anyone here, let me ask you this, is there anyone here? And there may well be, I'll be very surprised if there is not. In fact, I'll be staggered. Is there anyone here who's not repented, not turned to Christ with a humble, contrite, grieving heart, grieving at your sin and turned to God for mercy and forgiveness and a new life in Christ? Have you done that? Have you turned to Christ for a new life in him? An end to your old life, the beginning of a whole new life in Jesus Christ, lived not for yourself, but for the glory of God. If not, then God mercifully commands you today. Not me, it's him. God commands you today. He invites you to repent for your salvation, to turn to Christ, and he will graciously receive you. If you persist, can you not see, if you persist in rejecting this God, this Saviour, this, this Lord Jesus, there is no hope. That's what Easter Sunday means. There's no hope for those who continue to reject him. But for those who turn, there's grace and grace and mercy. There's forgiveness. There's acceptance. There's a warm welcome in heaven for you. Turn to Christ if you never have. For the rest of my time, I'll be speaking to those who have. And so let's look secondly at what Jesus' resurrection means for every believer. And the first thing it means is new birth. This is glorious. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that breathes spiritual life into people dead in their sin. It sovereignly transforms rejectors and haters of God into lovers of God. I was out there last week with some others uh, giving some leaflets out in the town centre. And uh, these leaflets that are on your seat, if, you, if you've seen them, um, Did Jesus Come Back to Life? Uh, evidently a Christian leaflet. Uh, we were giving some of these out. And um, the thought occurred to me after about the umpteenth time that someone had said, no, thank you. The thought occurred to me, this is exactly who people say, who Jesus saves. Jesus came into the world for people who say to him, no, I don't want you. And it was staggering. It was just an eye-opening uh, moment for me to realize that just because someone says no doesn't mean say they're not going to be saved. If God wants to save someone, he'll do it. He'll, 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 he'll give them new birth by the power that raised Jesus from the dead. He will do it. There's no, there's no standing against him. There's no resisting his grace, his mercy when he comes to you. So this is great good news. God sovereignly transforms rejectors and haters of him into lovers of him. He transforms those who are dead set on sin and living for themselves into those who are dead set on the glory of God. He transforms the likes of Paul of Tarsus into the Apostle Paul. Maybe you need to look at that if you don't know that story. Ask me afterwards and I'll point you to that. 1 Peter 1, chapter, uh, 1, Peter chapter 1 verses 3 and 4. I won't read too much of it because there's more of it coming this evening. But it just says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Do you hear that? Born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading. So believers here, let me speak to you. You who've renounced your old life for the sake of Christ, hear this. The power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead has caused you personally to become a believer in him. To be to caused you to become born again, out of that road to hell, into a living hope and into an imperishable inheritance of eternal life. God's power has been exerted in you as well by the power that raised Jesus from the dead. Once you were dead in your trespasses and sins, it says, living only to please yourself, but God, who's rich in mercy, made you alive with Christ. Now, this isn't in some remote way. So it's not that God raised Christ 2,000 years ago nearly, and God acts now in a sort of completely separate way. No. It says in Ephesians 2, verse 5, that We've been made alive with Christ. 
In other words, as God the Father raises Jesus physically to life again, he spiritually, across time in a way that I can't fathom, across history, he's, he spiritually also raises and gives life to all whom he's going to save. One of the signs of this is the way that Jesus changes from speaking of his disciples as soon as he's resurrected from the grave. He speaks of them as his brothers. This is amazing and beautiful. It was there in our reading, in fact, Matthew 28, verse 10. Jesus says this, pretty much his, well, his first recorded words after his resurrection. Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers. Meaning brothers and sisters, the Greek word includes both. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and there they will see me. Is there in John 20, verse 17, as Mary Magdalene is told, again, to go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. In other words, as Jesus is raised from the dead, it's God saying to him, you are my beloved son. And he says, you are my father. And he says, and these are, have you as, your, uh, as, as their father too. And so we are caught up. In Jesus' resurrection. Do you see how the new birth works? And it raises us with Christ. It knits us to him as his brother and sister. And do you see how eagerly Jesus uses that terminology of brothers and sisters? How he loves you for whom he died. He really loves you. He eagerly talks about you as his brothers. If you want something useful and helpful to do this afternoon, read Psalm 22. It's manifestly about Jesus. He quotes it on the cross. Read that psalm. And when you get to verse 22, it's easy to remember, Psalm 22, verse 22. When you get to verse 22, you will see how suddenly this is Easter Sunday moment now. This is his vindication. This is the, the changing. This is the turning of the tables. This is no longer him suffering anymore. But suddenly he's gloriously vindicated and God is, is pouring out his blessing on him. And you see that very moment, Psalm 22, verse 22, he speaks of us as his brothers. It's a fantastic moment. Have a look at it this afternoon, Psalm 22. And let's secondly, uh, thirdly, look at um, Jesus' resurrection, uh, what it means for the believer. Secondly, justification. Now this follows on beautifully and, and seamlessly from our new birth. As Jesus is raised to everlasting life and us with him and in him, so Christ's manifest righteousness in God's sight is imputed to us too. It is counted to us as well. The resurrection of Jesus is clearly his moment of divine vindication. It's the, it's, we've thought about that, haven't we? It's the Father saying, this is my son. It's, it's, the, it's him overturning what, what, what they did to him. It's the Father's repudiation of those who hated and accused and condemned Jesus. And it's the case at a deeper level too. At the cross, Jesus is punished in our place for our transgressions. The Lord lays on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, verse 5 and 6. And so when Jesus is raised to life by the Father, it shows that the punishment of our sin is complete. No more to pay for those who trust in him. Not only does it show our justification, not only does it show that we are counted righteous by God, it is that. Jesus' resurrection is that. God's declaration of righteousness of his Son by raising him simultaneously declares us righteous in Christ, all who trust in him. And so, Romans 4 verse 25 says that Jesus our Lord was raised for our justification. Now, I mean, we maybe don't take sufficient stock of this compared to, say, the first half of that verse, that he was delivered up for our transgressions. Rightly, as believers in Jesus, we, we focus on the cross, as we did on Good Friday, as we do at the Lord's Supper that we take twice a month. As we try and do um, regularly our preaching, we come to the cross, the message of the cross. It's also greatly for our consolation that Jesus was raised for us as well. Raised. Not just died for us, but was raised for us. So Romans chapter 8, verse 34 says this. Who is to condemn those who trust in Christ? Who is to condemn? And as though to say no one does, it answers it in this way. 
Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Do you have condemnation pressing in on your conscience? Are you a believer? You, you love Jesus. You're, you're seeking day by day to, to live for him. And yet there are things pressing in on your conscience that disturb you. Well, I want to offer you this morning a double consolation. A twofold consolation, a twofold comfort. Jesus both died for our sins and was raised for our justification. So that just as our sins were counted to Christ in his death, so his righteousness is counted to us in his resurrection. So what have we had so far? We've had Christ's resurrection is his defeating of all those who rebel against him and God. And also it's his rebirthing of those he saves. It's his justifying, his declaring righteous of those he saves. And finally, it's our resurrection as well. Christ was raised for our resurrection too. I started off by saying that Jesus' resurrection was a unique one-off event. And that's true. But also, there's, the other thing to say is that ultimately every believer will be raised physically as Christ was. Just like he was raised, so we will be raised at the final trumpet. So Philippians chapter 3, verse 21 says this, The Lord Jesus Christ will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So what do we see Easter Sunday? We see Jesus being resurrected with a glorious body, a body that cannot feel pain anymore, a body that cannot get ill anymore, a body that cannot suffer anymore, cannot die anymore. That same body is promised to all who trust in him to receive it at the final resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 to 23. Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. The first fruits is the, the first bit of a harvest. So it was an agricultural society in the Old Testament and um, you'd grow your crops and then the first fruits would be the first bit that you'd harvest. There'd be lots more to come. The first fruits was, was that. And so Christ has been raised as the first fruits. There's lots more to come. Lots more resurrection like his for everyone who believes in him. For as a man came death, it says, sorry, as by a man came death, that's Adam, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead, that's Jesus. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So do you see then, for believers, we have these three powerful effects of Christ's resurrection that we've thought about this morning. New birth, justification, being counted righteous in God's sight, and finally resurrection. Those are, do you recognize those three things? They're, they're in the golden chain in Romans 8, verse 30. Those whom God predestines, he calls, that's new birth. Those whom he calls, he justifies, he counts them righteous. Those whom he justifies, he glorifies. That's our resurrection. Do you see that they're all of a piece, all one seamless whole, three aspects of one seamless whole, all powered by the raising of our Lord from the dead. We thought this morning about the awesome power of Christ in his resurrection life, which every single one of us will experience in one way or another, either for judgment or for salvation. Every single one of us will experience the power of Christ one way or the other. In view of the great things that are at stake, we need a fitting exhortation to end with this morning. And I think it's to be found in Colossians chapter 3. So turn with me to one final passage as we close. Colossians chapter 3, page 984. I'll read from verse 1. I won't read the whole chapter. Colossians 3, verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ. Okay, that's our theme. And there's an if there. 
if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died. That's your repentance. Talk. That's talking about your repentance. The moment you turn to Christ. You have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's your new life you have in Christ if you're a believer. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore. There's a therefore there. Therefore, put to death what, what is earthly in you. What sorts of things? These sorts of things. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander and obscene talk from your mouth. Down to verse 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Do you see? Do you see this? If, if you've been raised with Christ, then there's a new life to live. It's not a case of just go do your own thing again, just live for yourself. No. If you believe in him, there's a new life to live. He's already set you on that path. And so pursue the things that are above where Christ is. In other words, pursue the new life he's obtained for you through his death and resurrection. Pursue that relationship with God he's given you, that reconciliation with the Father. And by the power of that new life, put to death sin, verse 5, and put on, verse 12, all the characteristics of the new life that Christ gives. Kindness, meekness, and so on. Seeking to live your whole life for the glory of God, your Saviour. So let all of us who hope to receive Christ's salvation do what it says here. Let's pursue Christ. And let's glory in all that he's obtained for us. And let's seek to be conformed to this image and walk in newness of life, not like we used to live before Christ saved us, but that new life he saved us into, as God the Father has raised him from the dead. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we've thought about the power that you've exerted in your Son when you raised him from the dead, and how that power overflows to us, every single one of us, Oh, Heavenly Father, may those who are still resistant to humbling themselves before you and coming to Christ for salvation through him, may they see the danger they are in, the peril because Christ is risen from the dead, the judge of all the earth. May they come in repentance. May they come by your grace and mercy. Work in their hearts. We thank you for the power that you exerted in Christ for salvation as well. Thank you that there is new birth, a new life to be begun. There is being counted righteous in your sight and there's resurrection to come. May we pursue this new life in Christ. May we not hear that exhortation of Colossians and let that fall on deaf ears, but may we pursue this life that you've saved us into and live for Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.